Hi, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the IOSH Manchester and Northwest Districts branch. And yet again, we have another fantastic presentation for you, uh, all organized by your committee. Um, plenty in the pipeline and so many that we've done already. Um, today we've got a presentation on situational risk management by Andrew Prothero of PCR Global and the letters after his name speak for him for itself really he's, he's pretty well qualified to to do this side uh, to do situational risk management um bit of housekeeping for you all um you've got two buttons at the bottom of your screen you've got the chat and you've got the q a and the chat if you've got any uh, technical issues if you're really struggling with uh, bandwidth one of the first things to do is turn your video off and listen to the webinar um, but otherwise, send us a message if you're struggling and we'll try and get back to you. You've got another branch, uh, another uh, icon, that's the chat, uh, the Q&A icon. Uh, the Q&A icon is for any questions during Ad Andrew's presentation. We'll try and answer them uh, either during it or after it, depending on, uh, depending on what the time is. Um, Ashley will be looking after that side of it for us. And without further ado, we have Andrew Prothero and its situational risk management. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you very much for joining everybody. And Stuart, thank you very much for mentioning those letters after my name. After leaving the school as an infantryman without any qualification, I'm pretty proud of them myself. Don't often don't like showing them, but thank you very much for that. So today's webinar, we'll discuss uh, perception, hazard identification and risk assessment, how training and teamwork can save lives, introduction to enterprise risk management, and the overlaps between security and safety, and then a small piece about mental health and the career benefits of lifelong learning. As mentioned by Stuart, it is all under the banner of situational risk management, which I'll explain as we go through. So very brief, Introduction to PCR Global, we're a training and consultancy. We specialise in security management, crisis management, health and safety management, and environmental management. And we also operate in uh, what would be called complex uh, env en environments, undertaking consultancy and auditing. We specialise in the ISO standards that you can see on, the, on your screen, uh, the bottom two, eight and nine, which aren't certifiable, but we take a deep interest and you'll see that as we go through the webinar. Areas of operation, um, we're quite fortunate to get around the world, sort of wishing to improve safety, security, quality and environmental management of the organisations we're involved in. I do my auditing for an organisation called uh, MSS Global. They are a specialist certification body for complex environments. So a slight, uh, a slight background to myself uh, on my career. I left the military in 2005. I, I went over to Iraq to work on the, in the private security industry. I was there for three years. I left there, went down to London, spent five years um, doing close protection uh, for a well-known individual, for Mr. Mohammed Al-Fayed on his uh, personal security team. And since, that, I, since then, I've been operating as a risk manager, health and safety manager, uh, quality manager um, on consultancy contracts or full-time. My main interests are system failures and it's what I've grown to call upstream decisions affecting downstream sort of personnel. So that's decisions made high up in the organization uh, that affect the, the guys and girls on the ground, otherwise known as accidents waiting to happen. And I've been developing my sort of my, my understanding of the benefits of having a planning mindset and approaching sort of every hazard and risk with a focused risk assessment sort of methodology. Before we start the first couple of slides, uh, I just want to talk about the facts of history, uh, something that can and does repeat itself. I often use this slide um, about remembering 1966. I'm sure a lot of people may jump to the wrong conclusion when we mention 1966, but being a Welshman and coming from Wales, it actually um, relates, uh, resonates, I should say, quite closely with one of the biggest sort of Welsh mining disasters that we've had. 
So as you can see there, that's coal tip number seven, um, coming crashing down onto Pant Class Primary School on October the 21st, 1966. And as you can see, 144 people died, 116 of them being children. So the facts of history, these facts stay with us. And this is a slide that uh, resonates with me uh, quite deeply. So this is the, the 21 year old police officer from Eartha who was the first lady on the, on the scene. And when we listened to what she said, uh, they were bringing out the dead children. One of the miners passing them through on the stretchers just looked at one child and passed him on. He just looked at me and said, that was my child and he just carried on working. So I think we can actually link that through to some of the security incidents, the Manchester Arena bombing, I think there's lessons to be learned, and they are now the facts of history. So the facts of history, as it says at the top, it's, it obviously crosses security or occupational health and safety. And a, a, good, a good phrase by George Santayana, which is, those who can't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. James Reason, I'm sure all of us uh, who are deeply involved in health and safety will know Mr. Reason's work. And he goes on to say that errors are consequences, they're not causes. So they all have a history. Only by understanding the circumstances can we hope to limit the chances of their occurrence, recurrence. So just a takeaway from that brief introduction there, the facts of history, as we, we all know, and even in our own lives, are littered with lessons to be learned. And if we fail to see them, we can in fact sow the seeds of our own crisis. So for me, a big turning point in my career was my time spent in, in Iraq from 2005 to 2008, which actually led me into my why for health and safety risk management. As I said, I follow that through with a planning mindset and a risk assessment uh, methodology. And anybody who's been in the, in the military who has served uh, will understand this PowerPoint slide. No plan survives first contact with the enemy. It means we've always got to think of a plan B. We have to be trained and ready to follow up with the plan B. Or as simply as Mike Tyson would put it, everybody has a plan until they get hit. For me, getting hit uh, in Iraq, it was, I, I won't say common, but I was involved in um, a number of serious incidents. The two that you can see on the screen um, was in that both in Basra, the one on the left-hand side, it was actually in the convoy of vehicles behind that vehicle when the four contractors lost their lives. And on the right-hand side, um, the actual vehicle you can see there is a vehicle that was driven by a very good friend of mine. Um, who I actually brought into the organization, which he unfortunately uh, lost his life. So anybody who's been involved in that sort of situation, those things stay with you all the time, of course. Another incident that sort of resonates with my real thinking currently of the planning mindset and the risk assessment methodology. Um, on the left-hand side, a number of um, UK nationals were taken hostage from that location. And it was an area, a location that we used to operate in quite regularly. So if you, if you, if, if you live a life whereby you've got missed calls, it does really resonate and, it, and you take that forward into your, your, your current way of thinking. And this really was the turning point in, in my career. So you can see myself on the right hand side there with um, the security team that I operated with uh, for a long time out there. In those days, it was, it was common to, to leave the, the safety of your area wearing, actually wearing tourniquets on your legs. It was, not, it was not a good time when I look back and I can't really think of the mindset I had at that time, but some of the incidents that uh, we ended up getting involved in, as I say, really was the turning point from security to safety for myself. As a photograph of uh, my vehicle, I was a commander in that vehicle, and we were attacked by a three-sided ambush. I'm, it's very possible that people watching uh, the webinar today has obviously operated in that environment. 
And what you can see on the right hand side there was a PowerPoint slide that I made up in 2006 to share to the other embassies and the other teams that were over there. And basically, um, what got us out of that situation was the actual training uh, that we put in. So as you can see on the left hand slide, uh, my vehicle is left, uh, left burning on the side of the road and we managed to, to leave the scene. I actually cross-decked the client uh, and his dog. I managed to cross-deck uh, the client um, while the remainder of the team um, sort of uh, held our position, giving us sort of the, the clearance that we, we could to leave. On the right-hand slide there, you can see my vehicle and you can see the, well, the wall that we believe the IED was in and one of the, um, the shooting points top left of the black arrow. So training and teamwork, it certainly, it certainly can lives, save lives. I'm often heard say now upstream decisions that affect some downstream uh, personnel. If we think of an incident or a loss, and then we again leaning on James Reason's teachings about latent failures leading to active failures, it causes me really now to look at the organization and the organizational processes the organizational leadership, the culture, and actually the management decisions. Because that's what's in between, um, that's what's in between us and the, and the incident, There's the defenses. But those defenses can, as we know, if we think of the Swiss cheese model, they can be open. So the organization then leads into, obviously the workplace, um, error producing conditions, violating, violation, I should say, producing conditions, which in turn leads down to the individual and the person on the ground, where we then have human error or violations. So the takeaways from that, that brief first uh, set of slides, when we think of no plan survives first contact with the enemy, I tend now to follow uh, Eisenhower's statement of a plan is nothing, if the planning is everything. I think we've all recognized uh, many organizations who've had their pandemic plans more or less just talked about um, and not taken seriously. It is the actual planning that goes into it, goes into those plans, uh, not just the written document that can quite often be a tablet of stone or sat on the shelf sort of gathering dust. So now to enterprise risk management where that leads to situational risk management and then convergence. If you're familiar with security, you'll be familiar with the terminology convergence. So enterprise risk management. So enterprise risk management, it is a, a holistic consideration of risk, which seeks to cover strategy, finance, compliance, operational, reputational. Actually, there's no, there's no set uh, area that it covers. It realistically covers all areas. And it's a different approach, it's a higher level approach. If we then look at how this is laid out in ISO 31000 in their risk management guidelines and ISO standard, it's not, um, it's not set up for certification, but this document, if anybody is familiar with it or familiar with its process, especially the first version, it's now into the second iteration. It really brings together enterprise uh, risk management into an easily digestible, easily readable document. Within so, that, an interesting area is... Andy, would, yes, sir. Just going back, back to that previous slide, my friend. <clears throat> so from, um, from where we currently are as an as a SME in East Lancashire, and I know that my, I've got my director and I've got my health and safety chap, John, uh, John and Gordon, on the line just now. So how do you see this 31,000 helping a small, medium business uh, implement change around that uh, risk enterprise management model? It's interesting. I could say this does, and then I could say the new IOSH corporate risk essentials does as well, because you sat on the course on Saturday. Say, would that be that course here? <laughs> that would be the course. That would be the course. I think as you, as, you, as you saw on Saturday when we went through this, it is about sort of coming off the page, taking it right up, into the strategic level of the organization through the tactical level and into the operational level. How does it help? As you can see there by those, those three sort of um, three frameworks, we've got one framework, you've got the principles, and then you've got the processes. It just breaks it down for you. 
Brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah. So from um, I mean that next slide that, that looks an awful lot like what you'd seen forty five thousand one, doesn't it? Yes. If you, when you the, the biggest thing that stands out for, for me when I look at this this model in front of us here is the, the terminology context. Now context, as we know now, is written in into the ISO standards as well, but it's been written in in this standard since since the first time it came out in two thousand nine. So context. And it really is, before you do any risk assessment, you've got to take in, into consideration the actual context. That's not just internal or external. It's actually what risk is it? Is it health and safety? Is it environmental? Is it, is it financial? So yeah, that, that framework is, it's, it's a positive framework. It's an easy framework to remember. We're all familiar with PDCA as well yep. um, from HSG 65. But I think what that does as well with the risk assessment element, it splits in the identification analysis and evaluation, three, three sort of uh, component parts that are a big in their own right. They need to be looked at at their own right. Brilliant. So as an example then, Andy, from, um, from that, just, just going back there, my friend, um, on there, if we've got an underreporting culture, for instance, how can the enterprise model help us there? Underreporting, I think yeah. it's the same. I think it's, that would be the same with 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 any model because if you've got underreporting in any organisation, it's it wouldn't be the model that will help that. It'll be the communication. Surely, certainly, communication is written into into this model as we know. Communication is written within all the ISO standards, but I don't actually think actually we can rely on the sort of the model to do that. I think it's the it's the senior leadership understanding of it and then the application of it as we go through. I'm, sh I'm sure if, if you took any of the models and we you know, provided training to the guys in the organization on that model, that's always going to help. But it is about the communication. I don't think that's actually just down to, down to one model. Brilliant. Thanks, mate. Appreciate that. So situational risk management. Um, this is, uh, I don't know if it was me who came up with it, but it's certainly, it's the words that flow out of my mouth. Um, and it's, what does it actually mean? What's it mean to me anyway? It means the situation. So all the circumstances and things are happening at a particular time and a particular place. It includes risk, as we can see by the title, and it includes risk management. The bottom two areas there are taken from ISO 31000. But situational risk management, if you think of us, uh, when we're on the ground, we've got our boots on the ground, and then ultimately we are met with those situations as it says there, in a particular time and a particular place. If we don't have that knowledge, if we don't have that understanding across the sort of uh, threat or the risk spectrum of all those, all of those areas, then of course, then we're going to be obviously not as, as accurate in our risk identification, taking it forward to risk analysis and evaluation. So for me, situational risk management means having the capacity and the capability in any given situation to make sort of positive and accurate assumptions, dare I say the word, of the situation that's in front of us, situational risk management. It certainly links through to uh, enterprise risk management. This is linked, linked through, there's, there's many books. We can see the security risk management on the left and health and safety risk management on the right. Very good books, by the way. And then in the center of that, I've put the fundamentals of risk management. Um, that in itself brings, again, it brings those two areas from the left and the right, it bring those, brings those sort of together. And it's the same for the ISO standards. On the left, we've got the security standard. On the right-hand side, we've got the health and safety standard. And then again, in the centre, we have ISO 31000. So it is just giving you that holistic, holistic overarching look on across, across the, 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 sort of the risk elements within the organisation. So then we have security risk management, um, the international standard on the side and as on the left hand side. And as I've highlighted there, security and safety. So within 1878, safety is mentioned, I believe, 43 times. So we can see that convergence. We can see the overlap starting to, to come in. The convergence uh, of enterprise and corporate um, risk, that's just come through now in the new IOSH Corporate Risk Essentials course, which, which Ashley sat on with me on the weekend. Um, and it covers the theory, part one is theory, and then part two is, is, uh, is the framework. But certainly that convergence there, we can see it across the board, especially when organizations are under sort of 
when we think of the financial challenges and we've got the pressures uh, to double hat a lot of health and safety consultants, we start with what we know, he's the HSE consultant, but realistically, what do we know about environmental? We know we've been involved in little security issues, but what do we actually know about security? So that convergence is, is clear to see. It, you may, some of us may be very lucky to work in organizations where we have a security department, a safety department, an environmental department and a quality department. I certainly audit organizations like that, but I think for, for general SMEs in our localities, it's not, it's usually one or two individuals. Well, I think Andrew, the, the biggest takeaway for me over the weekend um, was definitely the top down. So that information flow, the whole presence, the value set, the, the terms, the, the risk profile, all of those things for me, um, can justify chunks certainly in, in my life where I just think oh if I have that piece of information that will make life a lot clearer both for myself and for folks in our team. Yeah I think I think what came out of that on the weekend Ash was you know we had some some, some very qualified and responsible individuals on our on our actual course and I think the terminology they'd heard before they, they'd never actually seen how that can actually be put into practice using the risk framework document which we, which we looked at using the risk appetite discussion grid. You don't, you don't see that. So I do applaud IOSH for putting that in there. And then people can actually sort of visualize what it is to do. I think um, you've probably heard of Bloom's taxonomy, um, whereby people tend to remember things rather than understand them and being able to sort of apply them. And I think people do remember what risk appetite is. I think, I think you did on Saturday because your feedback said that you were a little bit hungry at the end of it. So I think we all know, we all know what appetite is, but on that course, we actually delved into it with the risk appetite grid and the framework. Great course, mate, great course. Sorry, so yeah, so some of the takeaways from that there, we had the, the removal of silos. So that's what ERM does. It removes the silos. Um, it does certainly increase uh, awareness and it can improve communication. Competence, I've highlighted there because there is a risk of, of being sort of double-hatted. I see it far more with security practitioners double-hatted into safety practitioners as I do from um, safety into security. But as we know, um, with, with health and safety and regulation seven of the management regs, we have to ensure that we do have that, uh, that competence within the organization. So the next couple of slides are going to talk about the importance of perception, hazard identification, and how that entwines with risk assessment. So is it a security risk? Is it a safety risk? Is it a health risk? If we're starting to view safety and security through that sort of converged lens, if we're viewing them sort of in the same in the same area, then we need to identify if it is a security risk, safety risk, or a health risk. Because as as we as as you all know, if you're if you just take health out of there, health is only now realistically starting to get understood by organisations. It's starting now to be called sort of you know occupational health and safety. We know that termination term, terminology is there, but it's safety and health as well. And I see a lot of um, practitioners who don't really understand the health side. So if, if you're a safety practitioner who doesn't understand the health side and you're now having to deal with the convergence of security risks, that's going to be hard. And vice versa, if you're in security, yes, safety. And I know you sometimes think it's just a high-vis vest and, a, and some pat testing. We know it's much deeper than that, though. How are you going to recognize hand-arm vibration? How are you going to recognize the requirements of noise or working with lead if you're working on ranges? So how do we determine so perception, again, something quite close to myself, uh, close to my heart in terms of, you know, the recognition. How do you recognize you're in a dangerous sort of situation? How does perception work? Well, the books tell us that, they have, that there's top-down psychological processes and there's bottom-up processes, sort of your senses. Where these meet in the middle, that becomes our focus point. And then that's what we're viewing. And that leads then to our interpretation of a situation to our perception, and then ultimately the decision and action that we're going to take based on that decision. But that's the top-down and the bottom-up processes. If you're not familiar with that, that really is worth uh, having a look into and you understand yourself more, I believe. I certainly understand myself more. And when I'm on site with, with individuals, either auditing or consulting, 
I really do look at it from their point of view. I think you've probably seen the slide, is it a six, is it a nine? Depends which side you stood on. So perception. So situation, so that situation, now it feeds the risk assessment, going back to situational risk management. So the situation, what's involved in the situation? Well, we have the person, we have the perception that we've just talked about. Then that's gonna to lead to our hazard identification and then ultimately our risk assessment. So the control of that situation at the end of it is all determined from that situation, which is why I mentioned situational risk management. So they lead into our thought process. We start processing, going from left to right, sort of systems theory, and the output, as was I, uh, I need on the, on the previous slide, is that risk decision. All upheld, as, of, as I stated at the bottom there, by that situational risk management. So let's have a look at those elements, some of those elements, a little bit closer. Let's take the risk decision. So upholding the risk decision or the risk decision is supported by uncertainty and bounded rationality. Uncertainty we'll talk a little bit more about in a, in a moment, but bounded rationality, what do we mean by that? The opposite of bounded rationality is perfect rationality. And if I tell you what perfect rationality is, you will be able to work out bounded rationality. So perfect rationality is where we know what's going on. We know what's happening. We know have all the information. We understand the context fully. Everything we're being told by people is accurate. So they then are in perfect rationality. And I think already you've worked out that very rarely are we in perfect rationality. It's always bounded. Our decisions are bounded. Our rationality is bounded. And that is due to all the variables that are involved in our decision-making process. Again, situational risk management. So if we take uncertainty out of there and we just delve a little bit deeper into the word uncertainty um, as you would all know being involved in in, in safety or, or in security or risk in general uncertainty is a word that really does get talked about quite a lot and i see it quite often that uncertainty can often get sort of used as a slight excuse really where we didn't know we didn't know so is is uncertainty that simple well the the 31,010 risk management risk assessment techniques document on the, on the, on the right hand side, which we, we purchased sort of as soon as it came out really. Within there, it gives you that document, it gives us about 32 risk management techniques. And on the weekend, uh, when we were doing IOSH risk assessments, risk essentials, I was showing some of those uh, to the candidates. And it really is an eye opener to see how many actual risk uh, management and risk assessment techniques are out there. What that document does, it breaks down uncertainty for us. And it says that uncertainty is based, it's, it's, it breaks it down into aleatory and also epistemic. So if we look at the, the both of these two terms for uncertainty, if it's aleatory, then as depicted by the dice, it is on the throw of a dice. We can't work it out. We can't break it down anymore. But if we look at epistemic, we actually can. As the as the the, pic, the picture there uh, depicts, that is down to our lack of knowledge. So a lot of the time, it's not that it's uncertain because we're not going to know the answer. It's uncertain because we simply don't have the knowledge, and that's and that's I think um, when I do my audits, when I do my consultancy, most of the audits, I think that's that's the area we need to, people need to delve into those things a little bit deeper into those non-conformances, into those reports. We need to look at why people are saying things are uncertain, it can't be done. Well, you need to go back to first principles and keep questioning why, why, why. Again, situational risk management. So the, the, the PCR takeaways from, from that section, uh, are understanding decision-making, it is critical. You know, a risk, risk hazard identification, risk assessment, it's gonna end up in a, a decision and decisions cost lives. I know that, uh, hand on my heart, I know that. Other people who have been in, in sort of near-death situations due to, due to work, then I think you fully understand that somewhere along that line a decision was made. And if we think back to the upstream decisions affecting downstream sort of personnel, when we start thinking of 
the IOSH course, the risk essentials course, we think of 31,000, they really do push it up to the higher echelons. Let's get talking about risks at a higher level, but let's link with the guys and the girls on the ground. We need to, we need to open that uh, communication channel. We need to have that line of sight. Perception, we talked about perception and the importance of perception and bounded rationality, the opposite to, to perfect rationality. And then understanding uncertainty, where we looked at elatory and we looked at epistemic. So the next slide is a slightly deeper look. Actually, what is security? You know, I've said this, this webinar is about a link with security, but when I first started studying, in, studying security in, in 2008, then it was found that there's no definition. It's much like health and safety, I suppose. We, we try to go to the, IS, to the sort of the ISO standards to find the definition. We read a book, what's the definition? But more often than not, there's not an actually agreed definition. What separates safety from wrong security from safety? And we're going to have a look at some of the overlaps whereby as safety practitioners, we may be able to lend some ideas from security. So as I've said, there's no actual agreed definition. So a philosophical definition in one of the books would be the absence of freedom from worry or danger. But we also know we can have national security. We have physical security, technological security, information system security. So it's a big word with a very broad spectrum and also a word that actually means different things in different, in different languages. I've worked um, for a French company for, a while, uh, for quite, a, quite a while, and it's interesting to see their views on the actual word itself and how it, how it, what it means to, to the French security operators that I was working with. So there's no agreed definition. But what I'm relating um, situational risk management and in, in this context with physical security. So if you think of physical security, which I used to practice as a close protection officer, we think of people, then we think of procedures, the technology used, and also the hardware. So that actually could be, it could be your locks, it could be your gates, it could be your alarms, but it's ultimately your, your people as well. What I'm not relating it to immediately, I ask, I'm not relating it immediately to is information security. Anything, Ash? Yeah, so from a, from a physical security perspective, um, whether it's a machine shop, whether it's a large multinational, whether it's a small back street um, fabricator, um, those physical things, it's kind of your Maslow's hierarchy of needs, isn't it? It's, it's making sure that people feel safe in their roles, safe in their work, because um, that's one of the, our basic human rights, really, isn't it, Andrew? You're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. I think when we, when we see that the, the terminology phys physical security written into, into the manuals or into the ASIS, the ASIS Bible, if anybody's familiar with ASIS, then physical security there, is, it's, not, it's not so much about our, our, our emotions. So it's, it's physical security to protect, protect ourselves. Not so much in a work context, it's in a general context from a malevolent act, which we'll come on, we'll come on to now. Thanks, Ash. Nice. So the Malevolent Act, thanks Ashley, you led, you, you led me right into that then, thank you very much. So what does separate security from occupational health and safety? But it is malevolence. In safety, we're trying to keep, obviously trying to keep people safe, but we don't actually have, well, we don't usually have people actively trying to hurt themselves, and we don't usually have people active, actively trying to hurt us. In security, this is different. Therefore, it needs different control measures, it needs different training, and it certainly needs a different mindset. As I say, occupational health and safety is non-intentional, but in, it really is non-intentional, but in security, it's fully, it's fully intentional. If it's, if it's somebody's trying to hurt, hurt us or hurt our families, then ultimately, as we, as we know, that is intentional. So our, as I say, our control measures need to, to reflect that. That's what separates security from occupational health and safety is the malevolent act. So some overlap now, frameworks. Um, I showed a framework earlier on, 31,000. But now if we look at the flow diagram for ISO 18788, I currently audit this standard in places like Somalia, Iraq, Afg Afghanistan. And ultimately, what can we learn from that? We can certainly learn this one element, exercise and testing. So exercise and testing, it's, it's a very interesting area. So an area I'm again passionate about because the times that I actually got, um, got into bother, shall I say, 
in Iraq, we didn't really have that backup. So exercise and testing. I think we've got to ask ourselves some hard questions here. What, what gives us the right to think that our plans are going to work? What gives us the right to think that our work at height emergency plan is going to work? What gives us the right to think that our fire alarms and our fire risk management is going to work? The only thing that gives us a right is actually to test it. It's yet, I'm sure many people would agree that a lot of organisations, they don't focus on that exercise and testing. Incidentally, exercise and testing itself has its own ISO, which I believe is 22398. And if I can push anything on anybody when I do my audits, it is that look, look at exercise and testing. I'm fortunate in 1878, it's written in there. You, they have, the the organisations have to evidence that they've undertaken exercise and testing. So we can certainly, we can certainly take um, some really good information from the the flow diagram for 18788. So another overlap is with auditing and the three lines of defence. So back now to thinking right at the top, enterprise risk management, we're thinking of the board, we're thinking of senior management, or the three lines of defence. If we look at the three lines of defence, the first line, management controls, basically this is the risk owners. These are, these are, excuse me, people at the first instance, people on the ground where those hazards and risks are. The second line of defence, we have, this is risk oversight. If your organisation has a security department or a health and safety department or an environmental department, then ultimately that second line of, uh, line of defence is actually overseeing slightly the first line of defence. We all recognise that from the health and safety manager. But then we have the third line of defence and I can't, I can't sing the praises of the third line of defence um, from some of the rooftops as much as I do. I can't, I couldn't sing it enough. That is internal audit. And before I was an auditor, I certainly didn't realize the importance of auditing. Incidentally, I seen a, a, a comment on LinkedIn the other week about somebody was really looking to do some internal auditors courses. And one of the, one of the comments was, what would you want to do that? I'd, I'd rather watch paint dry. I would rather be on the ground fixing the problems. Well, I didn't comment, but I'm sure you don't really fix, the, fix them on the ground often, you fix them when you fix the systems. And that's the importance of auditing. So I would really would encourage anybody to do an internal auditors course. It does give you that uh, wider appreciation and opportunity to get to the place you need to be. And that's upstream. You need to be upstream where the decisions are made. Another overlap is systems thinking. When we think about a system, it has an input, it has a system and it has an output. As we see here, the health and safety or security system. Now that's going to be also your environmental management system, your financial management system, your legal management system. It's going to be a system that has an input and an output. If we consider security and safety in this instance, hazards, risks and attacks, then we're relying on the system and then we're relying on the output, being no incidents, no accidents, ill health or defeated attacks. We're relying on that output. But we're only as good as the system. Um, if, if you're aware of uh, William Edwards Deming from PDCA, um, he says that 90, I believe he said 95% of problems in organizations are system problems. They're not actually people problems. And we certainly, we see that in, in PCR Global when our systems are slightly lacking. Ash? Yeah, we spoke on Saturday and it's quite pertinent now about that whole idea about constructive alignment. Um, that's something that John, myself and Gordon in our business, we're trying to make sure that the things that we're putting out there is our, our standards for SOP standards for operators are actually physically what's going on. So the whole is more than the sum of the parts, if I remember my, my system degree there. Exactly. Um, and that whole kind of idea that we're, we're all engaged in this, we're all involved, it's got to be top down and it's got to be bottom up and it's got to meet in the middle and do what we say it's going to do. That is absolutely so true. I think the other, the other thing I add to that, Ash, which I haven't got on the slides, is the difference between a probabilistic system and a deterministic system. And if we think of a probabilistic system where it's input variables, they're so, they're, they're improbable. They could be anything. A security system and a safety system is a probabilistic system. It's like a, a, a private school system. You can put something in, but you don't know what you're going to get out when they, when they get their exam results. You know, so it's not a deterministic, deterministic, deterministic system, it's probabilistic. And I think by 
being aware of that every time you're putting things in it does force you to go back look at the people look at the managers look at your systems it's you're never going to get the, a cupcake that comes out like a cupcake every time sometimes it's going to come out with just a packet sometimes it's not going to come out but if we if we can keep that if we can bear that in mind then we won't put too much pressure on people and we will try and fix the system exactly as you said fantastic love it so where else um the crime triangle uh, so it's a bit of situational crime prevention. So we see the word situational coming into criminology, coming into crime prevention, and that's basically fixing the crime at that time on, in, on the ground where it requires fixing. If we look at that social crime prevention or community crime prevention or social crime prevention, that's more in actually trying to solve the problem at the root, right at its roots, where our situational crime prevention, like situational risk management, it's on the ground at that time. You're not always going to be able to fix it, but you need to deal with it at that time. So it comes from the crime triangle, the crime triangle, sorry, it comes from a family of opportunity theories. And basically people may choose to offend out of choice rather than need. And when we look at the actual crime triangle and what makes it up, I find this quite interesting at, uh, at the moment because a suit, for, a, for a crime to happen, you need a suitable target, you need a motivated offender, and you need the absence of a capable guardian. If we currently look at COVID when the beaches were full and we were being told not to go to the beaches, was that a crime being committed? I mean, was there a suitable target? Was there motivated offenders? Was there absence of capable guardians? Yes, certainly th there was. And I think what, what, what makes me look at things slightly different now, whereas we know we've got the people approach and the, and the wrong, we've got the person approach and the systems approach to when things go wrong. I think COVID for me is certainly it certainly made me look at a higher level again. And even when people know the risk is there, they will take that risk. So it's not always going to be the organizations to blame. Whereas I used to be organization, blame the organization because of, because of my history. But actually, let's be honest, we can't, we can't control everybody. And I think the crime triangle really does, really does help me to understand people's actions currently in COVID as well. And another overlap is mindset. So the gentleman on your screen there is Colonel Jeff Cooper, um, a United States Marine and the creator of the modern technique of handgun shooting. Now, one of his favorite sayings was, your mindset is your primary weapon. And these certainly overlap in security and safety. Mindset, as we know, is, is, absolutely, is absolutely everything. He also brought us his awareness code. I often use this um, when I'm discussing uh, with organizations certainly with the guys on the ground when yeah they're not really interested in hearing about safety let's be honest you know some of the organizations i go into they see you coming in with your high vis and they're not always welcoming but if you can turn that slightly and certainly i do i turn it in a security context and we talk about scales like this it does help raise it so situation awareness is um so white his scale no situation no situation of awareness you're a potential victim if you're operating in yellow, you have situation awareness. If you're operating in orange, you are sensing something's not right. And if you're operating in red, yes, you've picked up that threat. Obviously, Jeff Cooper was a handgun enthusiast, and this was all linked to obviously the defense, defense of the, of the person. And that's his color code for threat assessment, used quite regularly in, in close protection officer bodyguard, bodyguarding courses. It's quite interesting. If you find it interesting, look, look a bit further into it. And sometimes you can use that um, to get messages across on the ground a little bit easier than you can sometimes with, with safety messages. So another overlap, the discretionary effort. Again, this is leadership. And as stated by Aubrey Daniels, it's the effort, um, a level of effort that's given if, if people wanted to. So it's that extra mile. I certainly have had different leaders in my past and a lot of the, some of the, some of the leaders, I would say, I would walk, I would walk a long way with no shoes on for, but others, to be honest, it would be questionable. So it's the extra mile. And when we look at Aubrey Daniels, Aubrey, Aubrey Daniels' depiction of this, he provides us with the want to do curve, the have to do curve, and then the minimal requirements. In between that is discretionary effort. He talked about positive reinforcement and minor um, and negative reinforcement. But actually, there's something missing. I've always thought there's something missing from that when I view it through the security lens. And that is actually 
What about below requirements? What happens when people start going below requirements? And we have to be very mindful that that does happen and then leads into another overlap, which actually is the insider threat. So generally, safety, um, safety personnel, safety practitioners are not that familiar with the terminology of an insider. Certainly security operators are. And if you look at the Centre for the Protection of National Infrastructure, a very, very good website, a very good resource. They turn an insider as an insider is someone who knowingly or unknowingly misuses legitimate access to commit a malicious act or damage their employer. Lately, I've been dealing with some, well, over the last 18 months, I should say, some HSE interventions, and ultimately they were, they were brought about by complaints internally, and a number of those complaints were actually malicious, so you could view that as the insider threat. No company is immune to it. We can see the red cross here. Um, not that long ago, more than 20 employees um, responsible for 21 cases of sexual misconduct. So as safety practitioners, as security practitioners, we need to join, join forces, certainly in, in these areas. Can we learn from security risk assessment? Certainly we can. Um, when we look at a security risk assessment, and this is one that I've, I've, I've done previously, then we have various levels. And what I find with them is with the security risk assessment, it, it requires us to go deeper. We've got to go deeper into and be more descriptive. Crime mapping, we can borrow some information from crime mapping, you can see there, that's uh, Canary Wharf. So that's our information, that's those sort of our indicators. The threat spectrum, again, this is an area where security delves in that much deeper. There's no, there's no sort of parameter on a, on a description for a risk in the security world. You really do go to town on describing it. And we, I think we know health and safety risk assessments can sometimes force us just to comment in that little box whereas the information is, is, is far bigger than that. So the threat spectrum. Vulnerability analysis. Again, I'm just putting this slide up. It's another area of security risk management whereby you're then looking at your vulnerabilities. You've got the method of opera, uh, the modus operandi of probably the perpetrator, but ultimately now we have to look at how vulnerable we are to that. Is it gonna be a knife attack? Is it gonna be a long range shot? Is it going to be an IED? Is it just going to be photographs? We don't know. We have to look at our vulnerability. And again, it's an area whereby security risk management, we tend to go a little bit deeper. Interestingly, I've just highlighted um, a, couple of the, a couple of words there, out there, property deviance and production deviance. So in sort of security and criminology, property deviance, that's where we're actually stealing property. That's what people recognize security for, theft, internal theft. But what about production deviance? That's when people actually are stealing time. They're stealing time. If we think of stealing time in a malevolent form and then put that against sort of presenteeism in a HR form as opposed to absenteeism, they're, they're going to be different. So if we've got absentee, absenteeism from a, or wrong, presenteeism from a HR form, people are in work, they're not actively bought in for some reason. That could be any reason. It could be their concerns. But when we look at sort of product, product production deviance is the stealing of time. So that's actually being, uh, stealing the time you know, knowingly. So that's another, another good area and another good overlap. So the takeaways from that penultimate section were Malevolent Act, discretionary effort, frameworks and systems, inside the threat and the benefits of learning from security risk assessments. And for the final, uh, the final set of slides, the benefits, it's a small, it's a small slide deck, benefits of lifelong learning um, for your career and also for our, our mental health. So personal and professional development. I think we all have to ask, ask our question, ask a question of ourselves, how important is competence? It's critically important. And our competence um, can also be damaged by the other people's perception because we work within parameters when we work with people. So we have to be aware of our competence, knowing what competence is, skills, knowledge, ability. People just say it's experience, but ultimately you may have been doing something for 40 years, but you might have been doing it wrong for 30 years or it changed 10 years ago. So competence is a very interesting area. I often get into discussions with, with a PCR team on competence. Perception, we did, we talked about perception earlier on, but how important is, how, how important is it to us of people's perception of us? 
So how do people perceive us? How will family perceive us? How will work colleagues sort of perceive us? Do we look, do we wake up in the morning and look in the, a mirror and see a lion when it's not really quite, quite that? Or are we looking at people acting like lions? If they're acting like lions, why are they acting like lions? And I think it's time that we just are peeling the layers back and just asking those questions. Because we, we know, I think we know, we're clever enough in this country now to, be, to have worked out in the workplace that what you see is not always what you get with people. So do we want to be better? Do we want to be better people? Do we want to be better at our jobs? Well, ultimately, somebody told me this once, and I, and I really do appreciate it. To grow ourselves, we've got to know ourselves. So as the kitten is doing there, I think it's time for reflection. I do a lot of reflection myself, um, and hopefully that feeds back into developing my own personality, my own capability, and definitely my my capacity. So we must have a plan. We must have a plan for our personal, our professional development. I think we've all got our own struggles. We're certainly all on our own journey. I mean, for me, I ask myself in my personal struggles, you know, what, what do I like doing? And anybody who knows me, it's basically sitting down with a book somewhere on my own, basically. And I, once I'm there and I'm thinking, you know, minds are like parachutes. They work best when open, somebody once said. And I think personally for me, um, I throw myself headlong into, into study. It's helped my career. Um, and again, just to nearly finalize there, in life, there's no such thing as staying still because we're either moving forward or sliding backwards. And if we're not moving forward um, or we think we're staying still, remember other people are moving forward. So in your professional development, people will pass you. So it is good just to keep on, uh, keep on chipping away uh, at our own professional and personal development. So the last takeaway from that slide, um, Albert Einstein, if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life thinking it's stupid. I think that massively resonates with me. I left school with no qualifications and then I joined the infantry and then it was actually, it took the instances that happened to me in Iraq to really wake myself up and start asking questions, sort of, why am I nearly getting killed really? You know, yes, okay, I, I, took, I, I made the choice, but ultimately, who, who's making the decisions? So. I started my, my learning journey. I'm still on my learning journey. I'm nowhere near finished, um, but it's, it's a really good journey. It certainly does, does help me no end. So Ash, we're there just, um, just to recap and then any questions? I hope that wasn't too much information. No, it's been great that. Um, how do folks get onto this course then, Andrew? Because Oh, okay. Definite plug for you. Um, because the, the benefits I found of doing that course and then watching this presentation were fantastic there. So um, I think, I think the, P, the, the PCR Global website, my email, you know, I'm, I'm more than willing to respond to anybody's emails, um, more, than, more than willing to send out any sort of, of, of the literature that we've got on it. I think one of the, this, we can catch us on LinkedIn and all the PCR team are on LinkedIn. And if you do, like you've realized, Ash, if you do want to do the course, it does not stop there. It does not stop on a Saturday morning and end because then, you, you know, we give people the, we give people the learning zone, sort of concept I came up with because I just really want everybody to have access all the time. So even for yourself, that learning zone is going to be populated continuously. So you just be able to dip in and you only paid once for the course, remember. That's the type of guys we are at PCR and I really do mean that because we want, we want to assist people in, the, in their journey. So that's the recap. So we covered perception, Ash. We covered a bit of training and teamwork, how it saves lives, certainly in, 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 for myself. We covered enterprise risk management, the overlaps between security and safety, and then per, uh, only a small part of the, the mental health and career benefits of, of lifelong learning. Cool. That's great. Thanks, Andrew. Oh, back up to Stuart then. Uh, thanks, Ash. Um, Great presentation there. Not many of us can say we've been to the, some of the situations you've been through, Andrew. Um, truly inspirational in many ways, and, and, but what a story to bring you to where you are now. Um, I'm assuming that all the way through that you've had to grow, grow, grow. It's been a constant thing. Um, but, but like I say, not, not many go through the same circumstances. Uh, thank well, thank you very much. What a great presentation. We've got a little bit of a webinar feedback coming up on everybody's screens. If you wouldn't mind just giving us a bit of, bit of feedback on today's presentation. Um, and then following that, I'll tell you about tonight. Tonight we've got a Zoom. Um, it's a Zoom meeting, actually. It's, it's a presentation, though, by Simon Cassin of Ouch, or Ouch Training. 
He's a safety philosopher. He's going to talk about the philo philosophical side of, of safety. Um, looking forward to that one. If, if you can, uh, if you, you've got an evening free, get yourself onto that, get yourself signed up for it, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Um, so if there's nothing else to do, then I'll say goodbye to everybody. Thank you for coming to the IOSH Manchester and Northwest branch today. And um, looking forward to seeing you at all our future webinars uh, for the rest of the year.